why the, the, it's become a byword for, I mean, the first war was brutal enough, but there's something about this war. It's, it's the nature, it's civil nature, um, the, the peoples from a, the same empire turning on themselves. In the work that you've done, was there something particular about the, the, the barbarism that both sides showed to each other? Yes, and I mean, of course, one was, you're, you're, well, when I say fascinated, it's the wrong word, but you're extraordinarily curious, you know, where does it come from? Um, and of course, um, it's intriguing the way that what we've been seeing in Ukraine um, and the brutality there, uh, why were the, the Russian troops treated so badly, A, by their own commanders and all the rest of it, and how far back does all this go? Uh, David Aronovich from the Times sort of wrote a piece, you know, describing what he, what he speculated on, of the, where does this casual savagery come from? And I think one's got to realise that you know, there's no such thing as a national character, you know, there's no DNA of national character. Um, but especially in a case like Russia, where you've got so many different nationalities within the empire, and also you've got this fundamental split between, you know, Slavophiles and Westerners, you know, so you can't talk about Russia as a sort of unified uh, mentality or psyche or anything like that. But at the same time, I do think that all countries have a certain self-image, you know, not necessarily a conscious one, often a, a subconscious one. And I mean, in the case of Russia, it really does go back. It was what Maxim Gorky described as Asiatic savagery when he predicted that this is what the revolution was going to turn out at. This was during uh, the first night, really, of real fighting in February 1917, uh, when he's looking at the burnt-out ruins of the Okhrana headquarters with Shukhanov, a Menshevik, uh, and he predicts this thing of Asiatic savagery. And by that, I think he's referring very much to the idea which goes back to the 13th century of the Mongol invasions and the fact that uh, they believed, and as has continued afterwards in Russia, um, that terror, conspicuous cruelty, is a necessary weapon of war. And I think we're seeing this um, in Ukraine, and um, as a lot of the evidence has been showing. And so the, the, the Reds, the Soviet, the Lenin, Lenin's forces, they've got the advantage, they've got internal lines of communication. Exactly, very they've got, They hold Moscow and St. Petersburg, they can move troops around to different fronts. The whites, hopeless, attacking in different places, different times, and not build up any kind of popular legitimacy, just, as you say, no. pillaging and you, no, not particularly attractive alternative. But also, also um, incredibly um, stupid in the way that they were so obsessed with reconstructing the Russian Empire that they could have allied, made an alliance with the Finns, with the white Finns of Marshal Mannerheim, uh, or General Mannerheim, as he was then, um, with the Poles, uh, and with the Estonians and um, with the Baltic states. But by, um, you know, um, marching around uh, singing God Save the Tsar uh, when they were drunk and uh, basically emphasizing that uh, they were going to get these territories back under the Russian Empire, um, they lost the opportunity. I mean, Churchill was um, exasperated that you know, this great opportunity of coalescing or of creating this coalition against the Bolshevik government uh, was completely lost. So the Bolsheviks were beatable, were they? They could have been. No, 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 they could have been. And there were moments when there were sort of tremendous, tremendous panics. They thought they'd lost it. But one also has to remember that when you have that vast Eurasian landmass, um, it's very easy to make a rapid advance. Um, but then suddenly it will collapse. You know, you get, they lose uh, uh, the initiative, they lose the momentum. Um, and of course, you know, the logistics, um, again, and something we've been um, seeing um, recently. So, um, yes, there are a number of um, vulnerable flanks and vulnerable flanks, logistics, yes. yeah. So, the, uh, what is, uh, and who's the key player? Is it, is it, is it Trotsky? Who, is, is there a military. What, what, what is it? What, apart from the, they've got the Bentmore railways and internal stuff, they've got the industrial base weapons. Yes. Is, is there, is there, do they show, is there any genius there? Um, with some of them, yes. Actually, Frunza, who um, commanded really towards the end, 
um, into the invasion into the Crimea, was very, very competent, and he'd also been very effective uh, on the Eastern Front in Siberia against, uh, against Kolchak. Um, but, I mean, Trotsky was, again, could be very inspiring. I mean, you know, he, in Petrograd, when they were attacked from Estonia by Yudenich and the white forces there, um, Lenin was prepared to abandon uh, Petrograd if necessary, just as Stalin was later in the Second World War, if, uh, if it came to that. Um, but he rallied the defenders and all the rest of it. He was dashing around in his armoured train, um, in a sort of highly um, dramatic fashion. Uh, but um, there's no doubt about it. No, he did have often a very good idea, but he lost the key strategic argument, really, in 1918, which was, do we crush Kolchak first in Siberia? The, before the Czechs. We... The Czechs. No, not the no, Czechs. No, okay. Kolchak, Admiral Kolchak. Yes, and the Whites. White, okay, he's, he's the Admiral, right. Okay. Yeah. Fighting in Siberia, right uh, next to the sea. <laughs> Um, or do we uh, crush the, um, the whites in the south, right. i.e. the Cossacks, Cossacks and Denikin yeah. and so forth, uh, what we call the armed forces of southern Russia, which the British were supporting with all of our leftover weaponry and ammunition from the First World War. So the British are supplying lots and lots of weapons to forces fighting against <laughs> those controlled from Moscow <laughs> through the port of Odessa. Uh, right. Just about. No, that okay. was actually the French were coming through Odessa, oh, okay, but we fine. were. Okay. We were. Uh, but it was pretty. Cl it was pretty close, shall okay. we say? Yes. Good. Interesting. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. You can see why the Moscow gets a bit tetchy about these things. Yes. Um, well, even worse. Even worse, of course, was we had the RAF, and at one particular point, um, uh, Churchill has to send uh, send a message saying, you know, I think it would be a bit premature to start bombing Moscow now. Yes. Right. Mm. Okay. So we get. Um, let's. Uh, the. the, the the, com the communists uh, are doing very well. Almost, as you say, the war against Poland, the war, they start to look west and think, well, I mean, they're quite, they've, just, they've just got through this gigantically costly, barbarous, unimaginable civil war. And they, they're already thinking, hang on, let's, let's press our advantage here and march on to Berlin and beyond. Well, it was slightly provoked by the Poles, who, um, one has to remember, the... Um, Supreme Allied Command in Paris had not yet established a real borderline between Poland and um, and Russia. Or the so we're beginning of 1919, are we now? No, 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 no. We're, 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 this is now during the course of uh, late 1919, early late 1920. 19, okay, okay, fine. Um, and so, of course, Pilsudski, the Polish leader, feels, well, l listen, this is, it's like sort of the gold miners or whatever, let's stake out our claim yeah. as fast as we can. And um, so you have the Polish cavalry, you have hussars and lancers. I mean, it's, it's something out of the almost Napoleonic Wars at times, uh, go clattering into Kiev um, to occupy Kiev uh, with the agreement of actually the Ukrainian nationalists who they're going to install there. Um, and this is when um, Lenin and Trotsky and everybody says, right, well, you've got to push them back. Uh, and this is when the war starts. But this was also at the same time when they wanted to create this land bridge all the way along the Baltic through to, through to Germany. Because there's Germany's experiencing workers' uprisings and, and uh, all sorts of going Well, on. had been, but again, the timing wasn't quite it's right. Too late. Yeah, a, too yeah late. a little bit late, yes. I've always wanted... So when the, when the, when the Soviets are marching, uh, heading off to beat the Poles, uh, to attack the Poles, and they do quite well, they get to the gates of Warsaw... Is, is this just opportunistic, or do you think Lenin allowed himself to dream at that point, or think he wasn't a dreamer, I've learned that, it allowed himself to plan that the, they might reach Berlin and perhaps even Paris? And the, and the oh, Shire. yes, well, they were, funny enough, they were, even thinking, they were thinking of Hungary and even Italy. Okay. I mean, you know, which is, shall we say, pretty um, optimistic, to put it mildly. But, um, you know, in those days, with sort of the, the total chaos, I suppose one could have imagined that almost anything, anything might have happened yeah. in that particular way. But then you do get your, your favourite moment, of course, of the miracle on the Vistula. Yeah. Uh, the extraordinary moments. To quickly tell us, the, the Poles uh, launched a, a phenomenal counterattack. Um, a, very, a very big risk, but at the same time, a, a perfect, brilliant coup. Um, as uh, your enemy is advancing, you suddenly come in from the side towards his rear, uh, and then you cause total chaos and panic. Uh, a battle of... A, a, you know, are we in 1920 or 21 now? Is that... When no, 20. 20. Yeah. 
uh, it's forgotten about in the West, but which Western observers think this, is, this could be a battle for the future of Europe here. Yes. Which, yeah. Well, there's Charles de Gaulle, who afterwards, of course, is one of the French advisors, um, who afterwards, um, and I think probably at the time, recognised, actually, um, how well the Poles were handling the whole thing. Um, but um, you have uh, de Gaulle, you have Vigan, um, but um, many of them simply didn't believe that the, the Poles could actually yeah. achieve that, but it was an extraordinary moment. And, of course, it's the most um, famous thing um, for... Uh, Poles who were so uh, proud of it and they have tremendous uh, drinking songs about sort of, you know, uh, beat the Bolsheviks, blah, 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 and I can't, I mean, you know, it's amazing. Yeah. We <laughs> yeah, no, you want to be careful to get involved with a pole and a bottle of vodka on those occasions, <laughs> in my experience. Uh, is, is that, it, it, when is, when do we, when, when does that, well, 1921 the book ends, is, is, the, is the reverse in front of at the gates of Warsaw, is that important in Lenin's thinking? Is this, is this something that makes him think, right, let's get ourselves sorted here in, so, in the Soviet Union before we launch our international ambitions? Well, no, I mean, I think that in, to a certain degree it was the end of their immediate international ambitions. Um, the problem, for problem was that um, Lenin, had, one of the reasons, I mean, there was a certain logic behind it, um, Lenin realised that basically the non-communist West would form up against the nascent Soviet Union. Um, and that was one of the reasons for wanting to spread the revolution, so that, in fact, it would strengthen or at least weaken their enemies um, in what were going to be the, the difficult days to come after they had defeated the whites, which they finally did, really, in November 1920, when General Wrangel had to evacuate the, the Crimea when um, they broke in, broke in across the Pedokop Peninsula. So describe, uh, describe the state of the artist formerly known as the, of the Russian Empire in late 1920. I mean, what, what are we... The devastation, the casualties, the, the, the loss of industrial output and farming, what, what are we looking at? Um, probably 80% of the Russian output uh, and probably agriculture too had been more or less destroyed by then. Uh, it became worse the following year with terrible famines because uh, Lenin, determined to hold on to his power base in the cities, um, was sending these food um, detachments into the villages um, and saying, you know, grab the corn. Well, of course, the, the food detachments were given the uh, targets to reach. Um, but in fact, in most cases, the peasants have been burying their corn or even feeding it to their animals so that the Bolsheviks couldn't have it or turning it even into uh, and uh, into sort of raw spirit. Um, and this caused, of course, bitter battles between the peasants and uh, the Bolshevik uh, um, de detachments. And, um, of course, then the destruction of the railways, of the, uh, uh, all of the machinery, basically. No, I mean, Russia was um, in a totally impoverished and destroyed state. And the casualties, you know, the estimates run from 7 to 12 million people. Um, in the course of that war. I think that seven is very low. I think it's certainly over, probably just over ten. Uh, but most of those, of course, were it was disease. Um, we have to remember, of course, uh, that we had the Spanish flu, but actually the real killer was typhus. And, I mean, the pictures, I'm afraid, of misery of the refugees, particularly the white, uh, the white refugees fleeing across the Trans-Siberian um, Railway and in these uh, uh, wagons. Um, and, you know, the, the bodies were literally just thrown out of the, thrown out of the uh, cattle wagons, you know, and stacked like cordwood, you know, by the side of the railway. Um, it, was, it was abominable. I mean, you get some very interesting diaries, which you can find. Uh, actually, some of the British officers um, wrote um, some very good descriptions of it and the way that, for example, the white Russian males, usually sort of, you know, the sort of grandees from Petersburg or uh, Moscow, um, the men were just sort of dissolved into apathy and alcohol. Um, and it were, if it hadn't been for the women, you know, everything would have fallen, fallen to pieces. They were the ones who had to sort of keep the family together. But, I mean, the stories of the individual suffering of those who were, in particular, you know, the young women who were totally, totally vulnerable, um, were, 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 frankly, were devastating. 
I could ask you, I could go on talking all night, but I'm realising it's, I think it's your turn. Uh, we've done 55 minutes. That flew by, uh, and I think it's right that we, get, we put the microphones out into the audience and we, and we hear what you want, to, uh, you want to know about this or Anthony's work and perhaps how he protects I... his own mental health, reading about these appalling things the whole time. We've got, some, we've got a hand down here, ladies and gentlemen. So, um, we've got can, can we have mic. the lights down a little bit, please? Otherwise we can't see. <laughs> I didn't get a chance to even read the book that I've got right now, but uh, how much research did you do on the anarchists in the beginning from the February Revolution to the October slash November coup? Because they were quite influential, weren't they? Sorry, the anarchists. What about oh, the, anarchists? the anarchists, sorry. Well, it's interesting that you have both extremes of Europe. You have the Spanish anarchists and you have the Russian anarchists. With a uh, certain number, I suppose, in France as well in those sort of 1890s. Um, but certainly uh, in, in Russia, and especially in Ukraine, um, funny enough, again, where all the fighting is going on around Julia Poli, uh, you have Nestor Machno and uh, his extraordinary army, which he raised. I mean, here was somebody who had had no education, um, and during the course of the occupation by Austro-Hungarian and Germans, but particularly Austro-Hungarians in that particular area, uh, he raised, he raised his, his own army of about 30,000 men and eventually started taking over cities. Um, and they had their sort of things like their tagankas, which were basically uh, carts uh, towed by often two or sometimes a troika of horses uh, with a machine gun mounted in it, and they, they could move very fast across country. Uh, so they were very effective in, in those battles, but they fought both reds and whites. Um, they hated uh, the authoritarianism of the communists, uh, and of course they hated the uh, domination of the reactionary whites. But there were also very much um, communists, uh, sorry, anarchists in, uh, in Petrograd, in Moscow, um, who to begin with were allied with the Reds until they realized what a uh, dictatorship it was going to become, and then they started blowing up, um, blowing up uh, buildings which were full of communists. So uh, there was a certain amount of uh, confusion, if you like, in that particular way. I can imagine it's rather frustrating being a commanding officer in an anarchist regiment. Yes, exactly, <laughs> yes. Well, the chain of command was yes. not exactly precise, yes, Very indeed. <laughs> right, let's go. Yep. Did, uh,